Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of State of Fear by Michael Crichton, the number one bestseller. This is a big old chunk of about 720 pages. Um, I'm only about 10% of the way in it at the moment, so what I'll do is one of my reviews where sort of film catch-ups as I go along. Um, I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... In Paris, a physicist dies after a visit from a beautiful stranger. In the jungles of Malaysia, a mysterious buyer purchases deadly technology. In Vancouver, a research submarine is hired for use in the waters off New Guinea. And in Tokyo, Professor John Kenner, intelligence agent and environment specialist, works to uncover an unprecedented threat to the future of the entire world. State of Fear races on a roller coaster thrill ride across the globe, from the volcanoes of Antarctica to the streets of Paris and the beaches of Los Angeles, all the while keeping the brain in high gear. Gripping and thought-provoking, this potent blend of scientific fact and pulse-pounding action is Michael Crichton at his very best. So let's go through, check out some tabs. So you have a character called Nat Damon that just made me think of Matt Damon. And this was interesting because this kind of refers to the fake news era, era we're in. Um, so Drake says, some, uh, scientists can't adopt that lofty attitude anymore. They can't say, I do the research and I don't care how it's used. That's out of date, it's irresponsible. Even in a seemingly obscure field like glacier geology. Because like it or not, we're in the middle of a war, a global war of information versus disinformation. The war is fought on many battlegrounds, newspaper op-eds, television reports, scientific journals, websites, conferences, classrooms, and courtrooms too, if it comes to that. Drake shook his head. We have truth on our side, but we're outnumbered and outfunded. Today, the environmental movement is David battling Goliath, and Goliath is Aventus and Alcatel, Humana and GE, BP and Bayer, Shell and Glaxo Welcome, huge global corporate. These people are the implacable enemies of our planet, and, par and Per Ineson out there on his glacier is irresponsible to pretend it isn't happening. All right. I got a few more bits of Michael Crichton for you, only three more tabs. I've not been tabbing a lot out of this, although I'm over halfway through now. And so this is interesting, they're talking about witness prep and jury selection. Psychological analysis of the pool, that's why I'm in charge of the focus groups. I see. We know that most people we put, might put on the jury will have heard of global warming, and most will probably be inclined to think it's real. Jesus, I'd hope so, Evan said. I mean, it's been an established fact for the last 15 years. But we need to determine what people will believe in the face of contrary evidence. And there's a lot of this contrary evidence to it that seems to suggest that global warming isn't actually happening. I would hope that Crichton didn't believe that himself. I think he's just playing devil's advocate. And, uh, but yeah, we get lines like this, so, well, take your favourite fear, global warming. The arrival of global warming was announced dramatically by a prominent climatologist, James Hansen, in 1988. He gave testimony before a joint House and Senate committee headed by Senator Worth of Colorado. Hearings were scheduled for June so Hansen could deliver his testimony during a blistering heat wave. It was a setup from the beginning. But, I mean, I've read Isaac Asimov writing about climate change and global warming in, like, the 1950s, so... It's been a known fact for a while. And uh, Evans' apartment, actually a lot of them have their apartments kind of ransacked. And um, he goes home and he goes, his apartment had been put back together very well. Lisa had done a good job. The slash cushions had been flipped over. The books were back in the bookcase. They were out of order, but he would deal with that later. God, that would drive me nuts. It took me ages to alphabetize all of my books. So the fact here that I thought was interesting, um, six inches of fast water is enough to knock a person off his feet. And we get uh, a scene where a body shows up and they think they can identify it. But it's one of those where actually there's not enough to identify it. So um, the body had washed up on the shore near Pismo Beach. The identification was made from clothing and from a watch on the victim's wrist. The body itself was mutilated, the result of shark attacks, the newscaster said. And I'm just like, hmm, that seems a little bit too convenient. We get a typo. Um, they're trees, Ted. Big trees. They have about as much of a message for Man King as an eggplant. I think they meant mankind, not Man King. And this kind of sums up the anti-global warming sentiment that a lot of the characters have, to the point at which I'm not sure whether that's how Crichton thinks as well. The threat of global warming, she said, is essentially non-existent. Even if it were a real phenomenon, it would probably result in a net benefit to most of the world. Uh, I don't know about that, mate. I mean, interesting fact here, I'm not sure if it's true, but someone says everybody is a lawyer these days, extrapolating the statistical growth of the legal profession. By the year 2035, every single person in the United States will be a lawyer, including newborn infants. They'll be born lawyers. 
what do you suppose it will be like to live in such a society? And um, they find that there's a major shift in the fall of 1989. Before that time, the media did not make excessive use of terms such as crisis, catastrophe, cataclysm, plague, or disaster. For example, during the 1980s, the word crisis appeared in news reports almost as often as the word budget. In addition, prior to 1989, adjectives such as dire, unprecedented, dreaded were not common in television reports on newspaper headlines, but then it all changed. And they say it's basically it's the media trying to rule us by fear because that's when the uh, the fall of the Soviet Union was. But they also said it was the year Sam and Rushdie was sentenced to death, which makes it sound more official than it was. It, somebody put a fatwa on him, which meant that he needed to be killed for um, religious reasons. He wasn't sentenced to death by a court of law. He was sentenced to death by a nut job. And we get this as well. Um, so this is Hoffman talking about why he thinks we shouldn't have these fake reports saying that climate change is a thing but think if it's not all right to falsely shout fire in a crowded theater why is it all right to shout cancer in the pages of the new yorker when that statement is not true we've spent more than 25 billion dollars to clear up the phony power line cancer claim so what you say i can see it in your face you're thinking we're rich we can afford it it's only 25 billion dollars but the fact is that 25 billion dollars is more than the total gdp of the poorest 50 nations of the world combined Half the world's population lives on $2 a day. So that 25 billion would be enough to support 34 million people for a year. Or we could have helped all the people dying of AIDS in Africa. Instead, we piss it away on a fantasy published by a magazine whose readers take it very seriously. Trust it, it is a stupendous waste of money. In another world, it would be a criminal waste. So George Morton ends up being alive. Surprise, surprise. Uh, and then basically that's all I've got there except I want to cut to the author's message. So he reckons that the earth is only going to warm by 0 0.8 degrees Celsius. Um, which I'm pretty sure it's warmed by more than that already. He says, I suspect the people of 2100 will be much richer than we are, consume more energy, have a smaller global population and enjoy more wilderness than we have today. I don't think we have to worry about them. I think we do. Also the latest, they, bearing in mind this was written... 2005 this was published we would have to have a hell of a population drop for it to now be smaller than 2005 even um, and the latest trend just shows the population going up and up so yeah the author's message at the end kind of left me on a sour note with this one so I gave it a 3 out of 5 my problem is that I don't think I don't agree with Michael Crichton's beliefs or interpretations of the science I, I just think he's wrong um, and this was kind of dogmatic in a way that it was, you could tell he was trying to make a point that I don't agree with. So it was just kind of a pain to read from that point of view. But I, I'm glad I finished it still. And, you know, the actual thriller itself was good. It was just the politics and the science in it I don't agree with. So there we have it. That's what I made of State of Fear by Michael Crichton. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.